Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group meeting today. Uh, I'm the co-chair, Ray Dogum, of this group, and today is April 26th. And before we get started with our agenda, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items, as we always do. Number one, this um, the Linux Foundation and their meetings involve participants and participation from industry competitors. So with that in mind, please be aware of what you're saying here. This is a recorded meeting and will be published on YouTube. Um, so it's just extremely important that you know anything you say shouldn't violate any of these rules. So please uh, make sure you follow any of your corporate and legal guidance. Second, all are actually welcome in the hyperledger community. So everyone here is welcome. And this is an environment where it's important to for you to feel safe and welcome. I uh, so just want that reminder here. And if you want to learn more about the Hyperledger Code of Conduct, you can find a link on the website as well. And just a reminder, these are the members of Hyperledger. Uh, you have premier members and general members. So thank you for all the sponsors and members here. And if you haven't been involved in an open source project before, it could be intimidating to start participating, but feel free to you know, start poking around, um, feel free to lurk, don't wait for an invitation to reach out to people or use the tools and join meetings. Uh, and again, feel free to read our code of contact as well. So with that, I'm going to jump into our agenda here, which we have for each meeting. And you can find that on the Hyperledger's wiki page. So you see the link here. And I also send it out in emails as well. Um, this is public, anyone can access it. And you can also create an account to comment below. Um, so to get started, are there any new people that would like to quickly introduce themselves to the group that might not have attended before? Okay, uh, not a problem. So I want to just also offer the opportunity for members to share any community announcements they have or anything they wanted to let the public know about what they're working on. This is the right time to do that. All right. Excellent. So I'm going to move into our some of the upcoming industry events that I've listed here. And of course, there's many more. So if you are aware of one and you'd like to add it to this list, feel free to let me know and I'll be happy to include it here. So the first one, which actually was last week and uh, has concluded is the HIMSS event that was in Chicago. So this is the health information, uh, one of the largest events and conferences. So there was a lot of different types of sessions and panels and workshops. And a lot of it had to do with how information technology is able to advance healthcare. So I know AI was a big topic. Blockchain was also a topic, but I think AI was the bigger topic this year. Um, this week, we have Consensus 2023 that's happening. This is more of a blockchain-focused event, and uh, it's happening in Austin. So if you or anyone you know is, is going, yeah, I'd love to learn about updates from that event. Feel free to share that in the YouTube comments or anywhere. Um, for the community to be aware of. Next, ETH Boston is happening this weekend in Boston. I will actually be attending that and I'm looking forward to hearing about updates from the industry. Uh, May 18th to the 20th, Bitcoin 2023 conference is happening in Miami, Florida, which is always a huge event, very splashy event as well. So if you're going to that, it should be a fun time. I don't plan on going myself, but um, I hope if you do, I hope you enjoy it. Next is Symbio Beta event, which is May 23rd to the 25th, which I will be attending. And that's going to be in uh, Oakland, San, um, California. So that should be a fun time. And then later on this year in September, the Convy 2X Global Blockchain Healthcare event will be happening in New Orleans. So you should check that out as well. Um, very much focused on how blockchain will impact the healthcare industry. Can can I'll make some comments on that one or ask some questions about sure. that one? Yeah. So I'm I'm in Louisiana, uh, 
Casey and I have been talking about participating in that conference. And uh, if anyone on this particular call has some insights, is is it a good one? Is it you know definitely one that we wouldn't want to miss? Have you been before? Those type things. I, I would love some feedback. Yeah, James, thanks for asking that. And one thing I can share is I have been to this event in the past and uh, my podcast Health Unchained is actually a media partner. So you can see my name here. Um, so I do recommend checking this event out. It's a rather intimate event. So it's not like huge and you're able to really you know spend time and learning uh, from a lot of these speakers and talking to people and, and connecting. So I do think it's a good event. It's in a different place every year. So uh, we'll see how it is in New Orleans, but uh, I think it'll be an exciting time. Um, I agree. So I, I can weigh into that too. Um, so James, I have attended in the past two. Actually, um, the very first time I attended a Con V2X meeting, I met Ray and uh, we met in a bar. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's, uh, I completely agree with what Ray said. It's a more intimate setting. There uh, is a good community. Um it's an opportunity to meet the people that you've been interacting with via Zoom on many of these call types of calls. People who have very shared um, interests and background. So this is not a good environment for necessarily sales because we're all doing the same thing, but it's a great environment to find other people who are active and supportive of blockchain and healthcare. Exactly. And I'm Thank scrolling you. here through the 2022 agenda. So last year's agenda. Um, so feel free to take a look. I'm happy to connect you with Tori Sinaj, who's actually the uh, organizer for this event. Um, and that goes for anyone listening in as well. So, so hybrid is on there and hybrid means different things. Uh, is it mostly in person? So there will be uh, mostly hard to answer mostly that, but I think, um, I'd say about 50, 50 at this point. I okay. know that Thank you. I think the live events will be recorded, but, um, I'll get more information on that to you later. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. Yes. And, uh, one more thing. So I have been, uh, Torres and I reached out to me last week. We talked on the phone for a while and she, asked me to speak, but I need my supervisor to grant permission. So hopefully I can come. <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to continue here. So those are the events that are happening soon in the industry. And now I just wanted to share with you all an announcement from Hyperledger, where we have six new members joining the organization or the foundation. So I just quickly wanted to like mention the names of the companies here uh, in case, you know, some of you recognize them. And uh, here it is announced its latest lineup of new members. So Go Ledger, Senofi Incorporated, Spydra have joined as general members while the while Digital Euro Association Digital Pound Foundation and the European Blockchain Association have also signed on as associate members. So just another indication of this growing community and uh, feel free to check out the full announcement here in the link if you're interested. All right. Any questions or comments on that? All right, so the next article that I have here is actually about artificial intelligence generating some buzz in the medical community as a way to reduce paperwork. So as I mentioned earlier, HIMSS conference was last week uh, in Chicago, and there was a lot of excitement about using AI to reduce paperwork and burdensome clerical tasks so healthcare workers can spend more time on patients. So I think everyone in here kind of understands that it's not a revolutionary idea, uh, but the fact that more companies and people and, you know, organizations are trying to explain this to the healthcare practitioners and industry is a good sign. It's a positive thing. And I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, now Microsoft backed open AI 
and ChatGPT, which has sparked a lot of interest in the medical community. And I believe there are some huge companies, including Epic. And I don't know if Epic is mentioned in this article specifically. Yes, they are. Um, yeah, on Monday of last week, I think Microsoft announced an expanded partnership with Epic. Um, Specifically here, Epic's first application of the AI technology automatically generates draft responses to the messages that physicians receive from patients through MyChart. So physicians don't have to use the suggested draft at all, but it saves them time if they choose to and edit or send it. So this is just one way AIs could help doctors in the in the clinic. Um, yeah, any thoughts on this, guys? I think this is really interesting. I'm, I'm glad this is happening and AI is becoming more of an accepted tool for, for healthcare. Um, yeah. You know, um, this is Wendy. I, <clears throat> I saw that news article come through and uh, originally, and it came through on April Fool's Day. And I thought it was an April Fool's joke. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. So, um, but that's fascinating and it makes sense. I don't know, uh, especially with Microsoft's effort. I don't know if any of you are using Microsoft Copilot. I'm not using it yet, but a number of physicians are using it to help them generate emails. And so it makes sense that they would integrate that capability to make it much more efficient to respond um, to patient information. Of course, not necessarily involving um, specific health, a uh, patient specific health or diagnostic material, but there's so many things that we can automate a response to such as scheduling and questions about um, basic questions about medication. So this is, this is really interesting. Absolutely. And I think like the goal is to allow these doctors to spend more time with patients. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing more about this and updates on this as um, the technology gets better and people can use it more effectively. And on that, another article related to this is Epic's, again, more detailed announcement here um, of them using OpenAI through Microsoft. So I won't get into the details here. I just wanted to leave the article in here in case someone wanted to dive in. Next article here is from Coinbase talking about decentralized app called um, Sweat Economy, or actually Sweat Tokens, and I think the company is called, yeah, Sweat Coin. Uh, and I think we've talked about this in the past as well. So the main idea here is the project aims to introduce what it says is a fair system ahead of a vote to guide the protocol spending of 100 million sweat tokens. So what they're doing is, um, in order to get more participation, um, each community member will have one vote rather than wielding voting power proportional to the size of his or her governance token holdings, as is traditionally the case within decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs. So that is actually a, uh, a challenge that the industry, blockchain industry faces where voting power or voting rights is heavily weighed towards the people who have the most tokens. So what Sweatcoin is trying to do is develop a system where they verify individuals. So each human individual person can only have one vote uh, versus allowing wealthy or token rich people to to vote more heavily. So that's the idea. Um, here the co-founder says, we believe that everyone should have a say in the direction of our company, regardless of the amount of tokens they hold, their knowledge of Web3 governance or wallet connection. So yeah, and it says here, the vote is likely to be one of the largest governance votes in the history of Web3 with 15 million holders eligible to participate. So this will be pretty big. And yeah, I think this was on the 18th of April. So I think this might have happened. So just do a quick search on that update if you guys are interested. So I coin vote. 
18th, 18th. Hmm. So maybe on a follow-up meeting, we can talk more about that. I don't see any articles specifically after the 18th. So I don't know how it went. If you do and you're listening in, feel free to comment and let us know what you uh, what you know. The next article here is from A16Z, and it's a state of crypto index that they released recently. And I think it was pretty cool because it sort of visually explains what's happening in the crypto space um, based on a bunch of different factors and indicators. So here, you know, you have a chart on innovation indicators on the supply side. We can get an explanation of that in the tool tip. And then you have adoption indicators on the demand side. So it's not just the price of crypto that they're following. They're looking at other metrics to measure how the crypto economy is, is going. So I think that's pretty cool and probably an important tool for our industry because a lot of times the price is like what everyone's following and that's not necessarily the best indicator. And I thank you for pointing this out, Ray. I read this uh, with great interest as well. One of the things I found so interesting was uh, in the deeper report was about the use of electricity for Ethereum now and how it's decreased by 99%. I thought there was a very interesting uh, graph that showed the use of electricity by Ethereum versus YouTube. And yeah. how YouTube has like uses now like 800 times more electricity than Ethereum does, the Ethereum network. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't, uh, I believe that. And I think, you know, YouTube just having so much data and, you know, video especially requiring so much data, um, it makes sense. I believe that. Yeah, well, the critical distinction, though, was um, comparing the Ethereum network after the merge. So, Absolutely. Right. When they went from proof of work to proof of stake. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think this is a great resource. We'll definitely be using this um, as we explore. The next article I have here is actually about CVS, which files patent to sell goods and healthcare services in the metaverse. So there's a lot of talk about the metaverse, of course, and it's quite interesting to see how these large healthcare companies are actually trying to leverage the metaverse and are preparing for it really so that you know they're in a good position once adoption has, uh, as they see adoption, I guess. And I still think it's a, you know, gaining popularity, but we haven't reached a critical mass. So in terms of what's the impact here, it says in the filing, CVS Health said it wants to trademark its logo, establish an online store, and create downloadable virtual goods ranging from prescription drugs to beauty and personal care products. It's the first pharmacy to do so. Um, though trademark attorney Josh Gerben said there's been a flurry of metaverse filings since Facebook announced the name Meta. So um, we'll see where this goes. The company will create its downloadable virtual goods using blockchain technology, it says. Digital assets and collectibles will be sold as NFTs. So pretty big deal for CVS. Um, I haven't gotten an email from CVS yet telling telling me to join or you know find them on the, the metaverse yet, but it's probably come probably happening sometime soon we'll see I, I am curious for the attendees in this group um maybe directing this question to james um do we know how organizations have decided to manage licensing and adherence with state statutes in the metaverse that that's really not my uh research lane is that what you're asking Were you directing that towards me yeah uh maybe i miss uh, remembered your background so okay yeah, I, I was I, just I'm curious much... if this group knew yeah it's a good question wendy um if someone does know listening here feel free to comment 
and we'd love to, you know, follow up with you. Thanks for the question. Um, just diving a little deeper here to understand what they're actually planning. The company will create three distinct three distinct store formats aimed at driving higher engagement with cu customers or consumers meant to serve as community health destinations. So that includes the traditional CVS pharmacy stores, which will provide prescription services and health, wellness, and personal care, sites specializing in primary care, and then enhanced versions of health hub locations, which offer screenings, monitoring, counseling, and treatment options, and also feature products um, as well. So yeah, it looks like an interesting development for CVS and we'll be following that pretty closely. Hey, Ray, it's Erica. How's it going? Good, how are you? Good. I am just trying to understand how prescription services would work in the metaverse. That's a good question. I thought about that too, and I was reading it. I was thinking maybe if there's digital therapeutics that need to be prescribed, that could be you know, one explanation because obviously, you know, if they need physical tablets or, or, um, you know, capsules or something from a pharmacy, they're not going to be able to print that out, <laughs> at least not yet. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's a good question. If anyone or like, yeah. and maybe they can get services that would set up, you know, like a mail order and that would, they could do that in the metaverse and then receive it at home or something. I don't know. Just kind of the services that they, that they would receive in a pharmacy that could be done virtually, maybe could be done there. So maybe that's what they mean. Yeah. Another idea is maybe if they're in the metaverse, like a patient's walking in, they're in like a virtual store and maybe there's like a virtual pharmacist they can talk to, mm -hmm. ask questions. Yeah. So maybe like that experience could be uh, enhanced with an avatar um so and then i guess they would have to have the drug mailed to them like you said or you know dropped by a local cvs or something right maybe they get like some kind of nft they could show that would get them their 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 drugs instead of a prescription i don't know right well erica <laughs> you're bringing up so this is wendy such great question hey, wendy because, hey um i I just really, I, I'm really struggling with understanding how this could comply with state statutes. And I, uh, because licensing is so critical. So mm -hmm. I, I, I don't, I'm just, I, I just can't wrap my mind around how they could do this in the metaverse. Yeah. Like location and all that is, is yeah. super critical for, for, yeah, the state requirements for a pharmacy, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know either. Um, like, even like, like aren't ahead. you licensed, you know, in, in a single state, like in Colorado? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. So, I mean, I have several different state licensures, but okay. it, it makes no sense that I, it is interesting though. Telehealth has a, I don't know if you've ever looked into like the way telehealth does licensing. Um, cause yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't know a ton about it because I don't provide telehealth services, but I, mm -hmm. There is some leeway around that where um, I, I, I do think people have to be in the state physically, like maybe if they're in the state, you know, whatever this this metaverse pharmacy only serves like, you know, people physically in seven states. And so I don't know how they, they could verify that you're physically in that state when you enter the metaverse, but maybe it'll that's kind of I think how telehealth does it yeah, um, like you physically have to okay. be. Yeah, I don't I don't know how they would like prove that or whatever. but. Yeah, exactly. Or establishing identity. Right. That, yeah. You, one thing I just want to mention on telehealth is, um, so I, I did used to work at Amwell, a telehealth company, and they would verify a patient's location based on their GPS on their phone. So that would be oh. activate. And that's one way they were able to do it. Um, so yeah, I don't know how they would do it in the metaverse though. Maybe something similar. Um, interesting questions and we'll see you know this is still just like one of the first announcements so i think there'll be some learnings from the in the metaverse and yeah it should be interesting and if you want to actually read the patent that is also available here so mm. or this is not it but <laughs> <laughs> this is the the link in the article so maybe we can do a search for the actual patent number and find it um, but I'm not going to 
dive into that right now. But if someone here is interested in doing that, I'd love to, you know, get your take on it. Thanks. Um, all right. So the final article I have listed here in this section is from the Software Development Times. And not super um, new, but you know, the idea of using electronic or of using blockchain for better electronic health records is another, you know, major application companies have been talking about and organizations have been doing. So the one thing I wanted to point out here that I thought was like staggering was here this line. Unfortunately, over 11 billion 500 million medical records have been breached since 2005, according to privacyrights.org. So now more than ever, with advancing cyber attacks and fraud, it's vital to begin implementing a secure system that can protect patient data. So I thought that's a huge number. Um, so definitely, it, there's an obvious need for this. How companies go about doing it and how organizations adopt it is another matter. But um, yeah, you know, the article talks about increased efficiency, improved data access, enhanced security, improved data integrity. And they also talk about some of the benefits for blockchain of blockchain for providers too, which includes cost savings, reducing medical risks. Uh, and then it briefly discusses how you can start implementing blockchain in an EHR. So, um, you know, a pretty high level article, but it's good to know that you know this was published april 20th so relatively recently um yeah any thoughts on this guys and i think um yeah any thoughts i i have this is wendy i haven't read the article is it mostly about theoretical benefit so yeah i think it's more about you know how it could be used how okay. blockchain could be used there aren't examples of what is actually happening right now that I saw. Um, you know, they talk about proof of authority as a consensus you know, algorithm. You know, the one thing that has struck me about some previous theoretical articles about blockchain for EHRs is that there is uh, many times the authors who write those don't have awareness of the technology implementations of EHRs and have certified electronic uh, health record technology um, that meets the requirements for the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. Those uh, the authors of these theoretical items don't realize that EHRs already have uh, a near immutable audit trail and capture significantly more information in their audit trail than blockchain would. And that the ONC is pushing so hard for patient transparency, visibility, increased patient sharing. So um, it's just a little frustration sometimes that sometimes blockchain authors talk about the potential benefits of blockchain as if we did not already have many of the benefits that are in that people are entitled to per regulation and directives from our national government or how EHRs are already designed. So I was just curious as to whether there was any insight to this about what is the unique benefit that blockchain could bring. Certainly, yeah, I think there are some like specific points they mentioned in the article. Um, yeah, like for this, um, the, the uh, integrity that you were showing earlier, uh, EHRs already do that. And there's nothing new. Um, so like yeah. some people, I, I've even seen some presentations where uh, a technology provider will propose uh, designing a blockchain for EHRs and they know nothing about the HIPAA security rule. They haven't does they just focus on uh, potential features without awareness of the regulatory requirements or the ecosystem in which the technology actually exists. I've even heard speakers talk about how doctors apparently, uh, according to them, run around willy-nilly changing health records. And of course, no licensed physician would ever do that. So right. um, 
I, I was just curious as to whether they took an informed position about blockchain integrations with the EHRs or if it was just um, uh, an ignorant position based on lack of familiarity with the current ecosystem and technology. Yeah, good points, Wendy. I appreciate the challenge there. And I, I'm not sure. I think the the author does seem to have just a high level understanding of how okay. EHRs may currently work. I'm with you there. Um, I mean, I haven't read the article, so I'm not criticizing this author. I'm just asking and maybe sharing one of my pet peeves. It's it's hard for us for blockchain and healthcare to advance blockchain when there are others out there that don't communicate as effectively about the current the, the technology that already exists and how blockchain is unique. Yes, I'm with you. And I think, you know, a lot of the information from this article, we've probably seen even three or four years ago, basically the same stuff. So I'm with you. Um, the same claims, the same okay. problems. So I do think they're, they may be missing some of like the. Okay. Yeah. Cause we regularly in, in, um, interact with uh, EHRs. I'm actually serving as a project manager for a project right now where we are designing integrations with EHRs and uh, we're providing benefits that are different than what this article proposes. So I just, is curious. Yeah, um, great points. I think, you know, I'm not able to speak to exactly what the author was thinking, but I do think, you know, there's a lot more room for additional information on explaining exactly how uh, EHRs okay. may, may actually, you know, benefit from this. Um, yeah, it, it's sort of like, you know, this is the theoretical applications that we think can work, but I don't see any specific examples or companies here indicating that they're using blockchain and doing this and that. So, yeah. I have a quick question for yeah. you, Wendy. Um, so, you know how like in the Kaiser network, patients have uh, really good transparency for all their medical records and they can see yeah. everything. And then like people that have other types of, you know, um, that are going outside of that, everything's like siloed and they, you know, if you want to get like, let's say uh, you get a scan and then you go to a different hospital, in some cases they can't even access that or whatever, everything's sort of separated out. I would think that like, I mean, I don't know, I know that there's a capability to get that all together and get patients access to that without blockchain, but people talk about that all the time as being the benefit. Um, even though it sounds like, or it seems like we could do that without it because everything's so siloed, we can't unless we're in like a Kaiser network. So is, is blockchain not the answer to that or well, is it? it you know, I, in my opinion, it can facilitate that. I don't know that blockchain is the answer by itself. So as we're seeing the Office for the National Coordinator of Health Information Technology pushing the concept of qualified health information networks called QHINs. And those are aggregations of health information exchanges. And it's um, we're seeing a considerable amount of progress in that regard. The HIEs already aggregate health information. Like for example, in the state of Colorado, before we joined a, a QHIN in Arizona, um, like Corio uh, combined uh, included records from 80% of the residents of Colorado that had electronic health record systems. So there are um, additional mechanisms. Oh, thank you, Ray, for uh, showing TEFCA. Um, that, that's a, a really powerful standard that's enabling some of the exchange of health information and how best to integrate with these QHINs. So we're seeing movement on a federal level to increase the capabilities I thought it was interesting that about two years ago, maybe three years ago now, Judith Faulkner herself was um, uh, from Epic was fighting against the interoperability requirements, but they've really come on board. And now Epic and Cerner are pushing um, modernization of interoperability between uh, their, cap their um, EHRs. We're also seeing rapid growth in their app uh, integrations. So, uh, independent providers can design applications that integrate with those EHR systems. App Orchard, um, which is Epic's 
kind of network of uh, provider apps uh, and patient oriented apps is just exploding. So I, I, you know, this is, this it just goes back to the argument that I had earlier about, you know, how does this fit into the current ecosystem mm -hmm. and what organizations are currently working on and uh, federal mandates so that we are not trying to invent something mm -hmm. or find a, a problem for our solution, but that we can better um, impact and facilitate the existing progress within that ecosystem. Thank you so much for the update. I, uh, that helps a lot. And I, I, yeah, thank you for, thank you for all that. I'm oh, glad, yeah, that, I'm glad so this welcome. is happening. Yeah, this is wonderful news. <laughs> well, and, and the timing is good for your question. I'm actually teaching a course this quarter about EHRs. And so a lot of this information is very fresh in my mind. Sounds like it. Thank you. Wendy, can you share where you're teaching that course for the? Um... Yeah, it's at the University of Denver, and it's uh, Foundations of Digital Health, and the course is primarily about EHRs. But I also in in real uh, in real life, that's so funny. I didn't really really need to say <laughs> that unless that was like a, a Freudian slip. Um, for my for my job, I'm working closely with EHRs right now too. And so I um, am really aware of the nature of APIs that are being developed for uh, EHRs and the integration capabilities that are greatly expanding in order to allow better interoperability. So it's just, it's just valuable to keep in mind um, anytime we talk about awesome blockchain capabilities that we, we keep, we, we as a community keep in mind the uh, ecosystem in which they exist. Awesome. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Erica, as well. Um, yeah, thanks. Great questions, Erica. Thanks. The final educational nugget I put here, actually, this is a a newsletter, monthly newsletter that I, I wrote for a company I'm working for now called Vibe Bio. And this kind of details how the biotech industry is navigating the recent sort of... Um, changes in the, in the economic outlook for VCs and, and the ability to raise money for, for, you know, biotech drug development programs. So I thought it was, you know, interesting to learn about how that, you know, industry is unfolding now that, you know, there's some issues with our banking system that we've seen in the last few months. So um, this article from Nature Biotechnology was published actually uh, quite recently called Precision Financing, talks about how important it is for biotechs to be very specific and how much money they're using and raising at specific times. And so why I'm sharing this with you is I think that you know in the future, as blockchain and crypto become more of a um, mainstream thing, it's possible that the way biotechs raise money could be through communities. And that's what we believe at by bio and I just wanted to drop this in here in case anyone was interested in learning more about that. Um, there's some interviews as well that I hosted with uh, a few guests in the drug development space. So feel free to check that out. Uh, okay, that's all for to let's see here. Yeah, that's all for today. I just wanted to thank you all for joining. Are there any other questions, comments, or announcements or anything people want to share? before we conclude today. Awesome. awesome discussion, everyone. Thank you for your participation. Yes, thank you all. Appreciate it. Catch you in uh, two weeks. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.